Tina kwe, tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. Welcome. It's great to have you amongst us today. And uh, uh, as a, as family, as a, the BBC Church, we gather and we're looking at a, a new topic. It began last week, looking at the the Spirit revealed and what it is that we can uh, do as followers of Jesus to encounter the Word of God in the Spirit of God. And so uh, I'm just going to lead us as we pray, going to pray for us as we uh, begin this time together. Lord, we we thank you that as we open up Scripture, we find more and more of you revealed. And uh, and this is where the tangible crosses into the intangible, where you, the work of your Spirit, which has been so present and powerful for generations, for 2,000 years, Lord, we, we just want to understand you more, understand you, and not only just through our head, but through our heart and through our spirit. So we want to commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we began this series by looking at how it is that the Apostle Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom. And Jesus essentially announced this in such a way that Peter could look forward to what it is that he didn't know about. In other words, here is something that Peter has been given, told, being told he's responsible for. He had no idea what that was going to mean. But Peter was given the responsibility of unlocking uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happened at Pentecost. And then he was called into Samaria after Philip had shared Jesus with the Samaritans and they had been uh, healed and they were baptized. But then Peter came in from Jerusalem and prayed that they would receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, Cornelius's story in chapter 10 of Acts when the same sort of thing happens, except it's a sovereign work where both parties, Cornelius and Peter, have this encounter with God that causes them to meet together. And as Peter is preaching the gospel, telling them how they should call upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved, the Holy Spirit falls upon this Gentile household. And uh, we see Peter there sort of like, hmm, oh, what's going on here? Uh, what can hold them back? from being baptized. And so uh, we see God at work. And for many of us, the work of the Spirit is something where we go, oh yeah, yeah, I believe in the work of the Spirit, but not really sure how it all works. Maybe some of you have had a bit of a tentative upbringing around the things of the Spirit. And uh, so today, as we begin this this talk, I just want to introduce you to Heidi Beasley. We've got a video here. And this is Heidi's story. Heidi works with our intermediate age kids. But here's uh, her story of something that happened to her just a couple of years ago. Hi, my name is Heidi Beasley. Um, I have always believed in the three persons of the Trinity, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I would say that I really spent time getting to know the Father and the Son and didn't really interact with the Holy Spirit too much. It was probably because there were things I had seen done in the name of the Holy Spirit that didn't really make sense to me. I didn't really understand them. And so I just ended up quite guarded to the Holy Spirit. And then um, I had some time where I was meeting with a friend for coffee and we were meeting together every week to pray for our families. And she said, I'm reading this great book and it's about the Holy Spirit. And it talks about the Holy Spirit being a person of the Trinity that you get to know. And she just talked about this book and how it really opened up a new part of God to her. And it unlocked something in me that made me also want to get to know the Holy Spirit um, in a new way. And he answered my prayer. Um, he taught me through books and people and conversations. And I learned about the prayer ministry happening here that very much relies on the Holy Spirit and heard stories about it. And my heart was prepared and at a place. I was ready. I was ready to have the Holy Spirit minister to me. But when I was in this, these prayer sessions and the Holy Spirit was moving and in control. I felt such a deep peace about the ministry that was going on and the prayers. I didn't feel judged. I felt I was forgiven. I felt His grace. I felt a hope for the future. I felt things could be different and that this God of light could defeat the darkness in my world, that I could be delivered. In that session, I was healed of two things. I can't deny this massive power that did rest on me. My leg grew um, about a centimeter and solved my back 
problems that I was having. And I was also healed of celiac disease that I had been diagnosed with for nine years. So prior to this session, I couldn't have gluten and I reacted when I ate it. After the session, I ate gluten and my body didn't react. And it's now been two years and my body's still not reacting to gluten. So I was, I was definitely healed, but this healing was just the icing on the cake. The real gift was this openness to God's spirit, to know him in new ways, to trust his spirit that um, moves really mightily in my life and in other people's lives. And I feel it's really affected my faith in Jesus. It's brought me closer to him. It's affected the way I pray. I know that God hears our prayers. I know that he can change in an instant, someone's circumstance. I know that I can trust him because he's good and powerful. And I know these things now because I've opened my heart to the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's thank Heidi for that. We find uh, in the passage I'm going to read today, read from today, that Jesus is in the upper room with the 12 disciples and he's preparing them for a time when he is going to depart. They have very little understanding of what Jesus is referring to, certainly no understanding that Jesus is going to depart by way of the cross. But they are understandably nervous, understandably anxious. And I don't know what it was like when you were a child, but um, I do remember the times when I was first left by my parents when they went away on holiday and I had to stay with an auntie or a grandparents. Uh, that created anxiety, for me, particularly staying with my grandfather, who forced broad beans upon us every night uh, in the name of good health. And uh, I, even the thought of broad beans now makes me gag. Um, but when we are left as children, there's this deep anxiety that happens, isn't there? There's this loneliness that sort of invades us, and we don't realise just how dependent we are upon that love and connection with, with mums and dads. And so there's a sense in which the disciples are experiencing this at the moment. They're about to have Jesus leave them. And I want to pick up on this uh, passage before we get uh, closer to what it is that we're going to focus on today. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? So you feel this childlike anxiety there, eh? You know, that little six-year-old whose parents are going away for the weekend and you're stuck with some relative that you don't really know. But... Jesus answered, <clears throat> I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth. Amen. The spirit of truth. All that Jesus was leading up to in this conversation about um, going to heaven to prepare a place, uh, the, the, the work there of the spirit uh, is being described to us as something that is tangible and yet still coming. 
And Jesus is trying to make this known to the disciples. And it's a very difficult thing for him to describe. We have the advantage of reading Scripture and experiencing ourselves, the work of the Spirit. We read about Pentecost. We read the book of Acts. But if you can only imagine what the disciples were going through at this time when they were just grieved by the fact that, uh, you know, Jesus had said, I'm leaving. And they're like, well, hold on. This isn't the deal. Jesus, you're only young. You know, you're like 33 years old and we're younger and, and we're with you. We're your team. And now you're going to leave us. And Jesus says, but that's okay because something's going to happen and you're going to be all right. I'm going to leave you an advocate. Some of your Bibles, that scripture or that word is interpreted as a comforter. But more recently, commentators are saying, look, the word comforter is just a little bit like a cuddly blanket. And uh, Jesus is more than a cuddly blanket, isn't he? But uh, we're told here that this, this, this expectation that the disciples had about being abandoned was going to be overcome by the work of the Holy Spirit coming to rest with them, coming to be with them, coming to guide them, coming to lead them, coming to empower them. And uh, in doing so, just take away that sense of isolation, which they were now tangibly anticipating. There's a, um, uh, a story that comes out of 1947 in the United States, a story about the first black African-American baseball player by the name of Jackie Robinson. Jackie was the first guy to ever be graded up from the black leagues into the first division. And he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And one particular time they were down in the south in the area around Cincinnati. And in that time, the crowd was vehemently against any black person being in this essentially white league. And so the crowd started to abuse Jackie Robinson, uh, calling him all sorts of names and racist intimidation as he was in the outfield there playing the game. In that moment, uh, the crowd was having their way with Jackie and uh, one of the outfielders, a guy called Pee Wee Reese, came running in to uh, to to where Jackie was standing and he put his arm around him. He didn't say anything but he just stared down the crowd. And over a a moment or so, the crowd quieted down and uh, peace returned. But this is deemed to be a a significant moment in the American Baseball League and obviously a significant moment when it comes to racial relations in the United States. And outside the Brooklyn Dodgers Stadium, this statue in bronze is there as a reminder of that moment that happened on that day when Pee Wee Reese stood with Jackie Robinson as his advocate, as his comforter, as the one who says, I will stand with you even though you're experiencing trouble, I will be with you. And this is a great illustration for us today because it reminds us of the work of the Spirit. The Spirit is there to ensure that we don't feel abandoned or isolated or lonely. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands and I will, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, and he lives with you, and you will be, and will be in you. The, the imagery here is, is one that um, uh, shouldn't surprise us because it's, there's a sense in which it's capturing from us, for us, the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, uh, man is created, he's on his own, and God looked at him and said, I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to create for you someone who will stand with you and help you. And of course, that's when uh, the Genesis story tells us that women were created, that we might be one together and help each other. And so the work of the Spirit is very much like this expression of a helper coming in to stand with you. Uh, And yet, at the same time, we're told that the world will not understand the work of the Spirit. The world will not understand what is going on here, even in this description, that this Holy Spirit will come and be with you and give you comfort and strengthen you. My own experience, as many of you have had a similar experience, uh, when you invite Christ into your life, it's like this 
great veil is ripped away and you get to see what God is all about. And uh, for me, I know at the time, it was like the grass was green and the sky was blue. It was always green and it was always blue, but now I see it as green and blue and beautiful. And you have this revelation of God at work and you see the works of God in ways that you've never seen them before. And it's very hard to explain that to somebody who hasn't had that experience, eh? It's like you're trying to explain the intangible using tangible words. You've only got Uh, a limited vocabulary, and so you're stuck with these limited words. Um, John talks about Jesus in the same fashion as the world will not understand him. And John chapter 1 says this, the true light, that's Jesus, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And here it is that Jesus is being described as someone who came into the Jewish community and the religious leaders in particular should have identified that this is the one in whom the world was created, but they did not receive him. They didn't understand him. And in the same way, the world cannot accept the spirit of God because the world does not understand him. Uh, There's a TV program that's been around for a little while now called Undercover Boss. Any of you ever seen that? Yeah, it's a hard case little program, isn't it? Where the boss, usually of a a big company who's not known to his employees, uh, gets himself all dressed up and looks different to what he normally does. And then he goes and gets employed to work in the business that he owns, working with the people that he normally pays. And so there's this revelation to the boss of what's really going on. And so, uh, of course, some people at the end of the program get a pay rise and a promotion and others go look for a new job. <laughs> um, but there's a sense there the same sort of thing going on, is that Jesus has come into our world and we don't recognize him. In the same way, the Spirit is working in our world. And unless you're on the inside, unless you've invited Christ into your life, you will not recognize the work of the Spirit. You see, this is how it works. You seek to follow Jesus. You invite Christ into your life. You pray for his kingdom to come. And, and then... Uh, you then recognize God at work. That's how things happen. You know, when we are praying, we see what God is doing because God will show us how it is that our prayers are being effective. God will open up opportunities, open up doorways, close them down. Uh, He'll bring people into our lives in ways that are just miraculous or opportunities. Thank God at work. And we get to see behind the curtain what it is that God is doing. All of this working at uh, a level of of spirituality. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. He will be in you. The Apostle Paul looked at it this way. He said, Therefore I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. For you to be a confessing follower of Jesus, that is already evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the beginning place. That's the starting place. And so uh, when we talk about the work of the Spirit, the very first gift of God, the very first gift of the Spirit is salvation. The very first gift is you accepting Christ into your life. And when you can say these words that Jesus is Lord, wholeheartedly, you know that the work of the Lord is happening in your life. The thing about the disciples is that they were at a complete loss. They were at a complete loss because they just knew that Jesus was going to disappear in some fashion. He was going to leave them. And they could not see how their lives were going to operate without him being there. They'd spent three and a half years following him. They were defined by him. Their relationship with him defined them as people now. And so the sense of abandonment that they were starting to experience uh, was probably met, in a way, um, by these words. When Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. An orphan is somebody who's completely lost. You know, they have no tangible connection to where they've come from. Uh, often at the mercy of others. 
An orphan is a little child with a broken heart. That little child who just feels that they have no hope because no one is going to take them by the hand and lead them into the future. Within the African-American tradition, um, there's this deep, deep well of spiritual songs that they would sing to reflect their sense of being orphans, their sense of being wrenched out of their homeland and slavery, their sense in which they've, they, they, they've been brokenhearted because their families have been separated, that sense in which they have very little hope and they feel like oh, orphans. And uh, so this repertoire of songs that they have is really just this huge ache that comes from the bottom of their soul, yeah, like an orphan. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long, long way from home. And sing with me. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long, long way from home. Somebody needs to harp now. <laughs> You see, we've been rejected in Adam. That's our inheritance. When we were released from the Garden of Eden because of the sin of our, our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, we were separated from God and we have this ache that makes us feel like motherless children. And, and, and Jesus has filled that gap by his presence with these disciples. And now because he's going, they feel that ache again. And now Jesus says to them, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Romans, Paul says this, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Indeed, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You know, regardless of your status, regardless of your gender, regardless of your wealth, regardless of your education, regardless of your marital status, regardless of your age, uh, we are co-heirs with Christ. And this is what the work of the Spirit is all about, is to reinforce in us the sense of identity that belong, allows us to see that we belong and we are made in the image of God, that we are not this inconsequential being that just emerged over an evolutionary process out of the swamp but you have this value that is intrinsic. You are created in the image of God and the Holy Spirit is given to you to remind you of your home and also of where you are going. Jesus said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who has sent me. What happens when someone comes into your home? Things change, eh? Regardless of who they are. But we've been told now that, that Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, will come in and make his home with us. And that affects us deeply because when someone sets up home in your house, uh, you're affected deeply by the presence of God, in this case, coming into your home, into your temple, where you as uh, an individual have this capacity for relationship with God that uh, the world doesn't understand. And this advocacy that we're told about here is that you will hear the voice of God. You will understand the leading of the Spirit. You will be given comfort. You'll be given confidence. You'll be given peace. 
And all of this is a result of the promise that the Lord Jesus is saying to us. Jesus said, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate whom the Holy Spirit but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. When we read Scripture, I've always had this this, uh, deep fascination with Scripture. And uh, the thing about the Gospels is that I remember reading for the first time the Sermon on the Mount. You know, there's three or four chapters there in Matthew's Gospel of this fantastic teaching that comes from Jesus. And I'm like, how did these guys remember this? How did they record all of these amazing words when they lived in an oral tradition, when everything was just recorded through your own memory, not written down? And here we read, of course, this is what the Holy Spirit has done in and through the disciples. He says, I will remind you of everything I have said to you. Yeah? Not only that, but the Lord will teach us. He'll teach us things that haven't been taught before. He'll show us things that others haven't seen. He is alive and powerful and active today as he ever was 2,000 years ago. And that's what gives the capacity for Christians to live in the modern world without having to try to drag our culture back to the very roots or uh, the century in which it was first formed. Why? Because the Spirit is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, cutting and dividing bone and marrow, bringing us to a place where we can experience the power of the living God, even if you are living in Silicon Valley, even if you're working for NASA. It doesn't matter what the mode that you are living in, but the medium is always going to be the Spirit of God working in and through your life. In this time of great unrest for the disciples, Jesus' probably most powerful words that he said at this time were this. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The worldly peace is just simply the absence of war or the absence of anger. God's peace is a tangible gift. It's a gift that says, I give this to you as you ask me for it. I give it to you in spite of your circumstances. In spite of the the tensions that you're under, in spite of the relational difficulties that you face, in spite of the health concerns that you've got, in spite of the economic future that we might see as being a struggle. This peace is a peace that comes to you as a gift. It's not something that you earn It's not something that you even deserve, but it's a tangible representation of the Spirit of God at work in your life, and it's a free gift for you. It's the thing that separates us out from the world. You know, the the society would tell us that you need to be worried, that you need to be anxious. Just jump online and find something to be worried about. That's how it works. And in fact, if you're not concerned, then I'm concerned that you're not concerned because clearly you're not an engaged citizen and being concerned about the things that I'm engaged with and I'm really deeply worried about. Jesus said, peace, I leave you. My peace, I give you. Which is such a contradiction to the way the world values things, isn't it? Because the world says, hey, look, the more you're worried about, the more deeply concerned you are, about uh, the world in which we live. So therefore, you are an informed citizen. And Jesus says, don't worry about this stuff. Don't worry about this stuff. Because I am with you always until the end of the age. And this tangible gift, um, I'll put it this way, peace is is a gift from Jesus, a tangible quality that believers will experience. And as we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in these coming weeks, I want us to have a takeaway from each morning. And today, I just want you to be reminded that not only is this peace something that uh, that you can intellectually assent to, but this peace is something that you can grab and take away as as a gift, as a gift from God today. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, aren't we? And even though we feel like 
We have a mother, we, we're like a motherless child at times. We know that the work of the Spirit is to complete us and to fill us and to allow us to understand that we are children of God in every and any circumstance. Let's pray. Please stand. Lord, we, we come before you today and, and we know, Lord, that this peace that you describe is something that is tangible, it is something that is evident, it is something that is powerful, but more importantly, it's something that is ours. It's ours because you promise it to us. And so I just want to pray today for people who are on that edge of anxiety, people who are feeling worried about the future, worried about their present circumstances, that, Lord, in spite of all that surrounds each one of us, Lord, we can find that calm in the storm, that being the very presence of yourself. Holy Spirit, we say come and do a fresh work in our lives that we might experience what it is that you've promised. Lord, we know that... Uh, the world around us would like to steal our peace from us, would like to take it away and hide it from us, that we would always be anxious. But you have promised by the work of your Spirit that you would find a home with us, that you would come in and that you would find the way to set up home, to live with us and to live in us. So we say, come Holy Spirit. We invite you. We open up our minds, we open up our hearts that the intangible would become tangible, that your peace would be our experience. This great, great gift, the work of your spirit alive in us and alive through us, that's all, all we could ever ask. So thank you, Lord, for this incredible promise that just breaks down isolation, breaks down loneliness, pushes back on anxiety and builds our confidence in who we are as your children. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.